West Coast, Australia, <laughs> UK, and um, good afternoon to those of you from the Central Coast and in the East Coast. Uh, my name is Dr. David Ajibade, and I'm here on the webinar with my dear friend, Sherry Platt, and we have a special, special guest, my mentor and friend, Dr. Raven Gowen. And today is really going to be a very, very special webinar. Um, we've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, the whole topic of glyconutrients and sugars and monosaccharides is a huge, huge, huge field, and it's rapidly expanding every, every day, every year. And uh, we do have a webinar we've done with Dr. Robert Murray, the professor with the biochemistry who wrote the um, senior editor of the Harper's Biochemistry textbook. Uh, but we also wanted to have something uh, less technical and less academic. And so we wanted to try and combine, bring up something that uh, people could share with their friends and share with their neighbors and their prospects that it can use effectively and that people can understand and follow very, very clearly. Now, a uh, quick, quick announcement. We will not be answering questions on how and where to get these products. Uh, we feel there has been a lot of abuse in that regard. And so if you got on this call because someone else invited you to get on the call to understand glyconutrients or glycobiology, please get back with the person who sent you to the webinar. Uh, again, we will not be answering questions on how and where to get these products. OK, that's taken care of. And uh, hang on just a minute. I'll just make sure I have all my information together. And remember, you can always, always um, uh, type in a question. Sherry will be there to help you take care of the questions. There's a blue panel to your right, which you can use and can access at any time. OK. Again, today we're going to be talking about glyconutrients. And let me just go ahead and introduce Dr. Dr. Go into the call. Well, both of you are, I'm sure, are very, very familiar with him. Uh, to me, he's, like I said, he's been my mentor and my friend. Uh, uh, over four years ago, I actually got introduced. Uh, I knew about glyconutritionals a little bit before. But uh, it was through him that I got to understand the power of nutrition and the power of glyconutrients as a whole. And that has really opened up a huge, huge field to me. And uh, I am, well, eternally grateful to him. So Dr. Gohan, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. OK. Well, um, as I've probably told you before, Dr. Gohan, you're, you're probably the most probably the, one of the most successful and well-rounded people I know. I mean, you've been at the top of your field as a cardiologist. You are head of two of Tulsa's largest hospitals in um, St. John's and St. Francis. You, I know you established what is now one of the largest private practices in the state of Oklahoma. Now, that's not all, but in your private and personal life, you, you've raised four wonderful kids, two of whom, two of which, as if whom or which, well, two of whom have been um, leaders in their fields, respectively. One was a, a, a world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. Another, the daughter, is um, the head of, uh, well, one of the top top authorities in breast MRIs. And of course, um, even until recently, you, you used to travel around the country giving talks on the amazing potential of nutrients and glyconutritionals. Basically, you've, you've seen it all. You've done it all. and. As now, yeah, this is yeah, now 94 years old. And let's show a picture of you and your beautiful daughter. That's Dee Dee. That's your that's your baby, the last born. And then to she's carrying your great grandson. <laughs> How many of them do you have now? Oh, <laughs> many. I haven't kept. <laughs> you, haven't, <laughs> you haven't kept count of your grand great grandkids. Okay, well that's that's great. Well. We also have here uh, a, a, a photo of you, though, your book, which is, which is called Maggots, Wonder Drugs, Transplants, and Genomes. And it's not so clear here, but it says, the memoirs of an old doctor whose career has spanned it all. And you share a lot of your wisdom there. But, I, but now for this webinar, this, for the next five to seven minutes, could you tell our viewers, our webinar attendees, what would you say, if you want to pass on to the next generation, what you think are the most important things when it comes to health and longevity? Well, first of all, uh, 
rarely does, does a person have a, 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 an outstanding uh, memory of some uh, something mm -hmm. uh, that, that has turned out to be the most uh, uh, important discovery uh, in his career, and that is uh, my uh, the date is 18th of April of 1999 when I first was introduced to glycometry uh, and uh, manatee. And since that time, I, I have not been disappointed, but only uh, more uh, impressed with what I have found and, and seen uh, since that time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it started, really, uh, I'll be using some names that may or may not be familiar to you, but with uh, Dr. D Dr. McDaniel, uh, uh, who was a uh, Editor uh, of, of the biochemistry of which mm -hmm. uh, John Murray, Dr. Murray, is also right. uh, on the work program today. Uh, right. But Dr. But now, uh, like, like Daniel uh, was a, an extremely important uh, enthusiast uh, and had a, a great deal to do with the discovery of the uh, glyconutrients, uh, uh, 10 of which are called Uh, Ambertose, which are necessary uh, for health, and uh, most people do not get all of these in their diet, and as a result, they suffer. Uh, when I first uh, was introduced to this, well, I was about 86 years old at the time, and I had I had. 21 diagnoses, which I can't uh, reveal. Uh, <coughs> yeah, now, you, you, you had 21? 21 diagnoses. Okay. And were on uh, eight uh, prescription mm -hmm. drugs. And getting along with lots of side effects from the drugs and uh, uh -huh. like. Uh, after I was introduced to the... Uh, glyconutrients, uh, within four months, I was off of uh, 20 of the 21 diagnoses no longer bothering me, and um, I was off all eight of my prescriptions, wow. and I was uh, much more uh, uh, effective, I think, in uh, Introducing this to uh, people in right. meetings and, and uh, the like, uh, I am, uh, of course, retired <laughs> at 94. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. I, I still feel uh, 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 I have important news you know, to pass on to. Uh, people with uh, my experience of this and and anticipations for future uh, experiences uh, mm -hmm. the nutrients so and would I you say it's the uh, most important discovery in uh, health that uh, I have experienced in all my uh, 70 uh, almost 70 years as a doctor oh, wow that's a, that's a lot of time so <laughs> You would say glyconutrition is one of the most important health discoveries ever? Is that what you said? Right, exactly. Wow. 
wow. And you've spent a lot of time traveling for the past, well, you said 96 or 97 was when you first got introduced to it. Yeah. Or was it 98? 98. 98. And since that time, you've actually been traveling and speaking and sharing this information with other people. Right. Uh -huh. And I know I've actually done some of those travels with you, and I've been Im impressed at the, the responses. Well, Budman jumping up and down on the stage and doing stuff that, uh, talking about stuff he did that even people half your age could not have done. So you have been a tremendous, tremendous inspiration to all of us. I'm so, I'm so grateful, Dr. Gowen, for, for what you've done. And I, I know people on the I'm, call. I'm do. so grateful for what? You're like an interest you've done for me. You know this, right, that without you, I would not be doing the things I'm doing today. Um, you're the one who introduced me to this whole wonderful field, uh, but not just of, of glyconutritionals, but also nutrition as a whole. And um, as a matter of fact, many of the people I've met, all things together, together with the webinar six months ago, and who's been dear friend, it was through my meeting you that I eventually got to meet her. And so um, I just, like I said earlier on at the beginning of the call, I just can't thank you enough for what you've done for me and for thousands of people around the world. It's my thank pleasure. You. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, well, you, you can, you can, you're going to stay on the call anyway. And um, at, like I said before, at any time, if you feel you need to interject or add a few points, please go ahead, stop me, interrupt me. Now we can go on. OK? I'm not sure. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, and God bless you. God bless you, too, sir. All right, folks, there you have it. There's the master has just spoken, and um, those were his teeth, folks. Those were his real teeth. <laughs> um, today, like I said, it was a study about glyconutritionals, and really the way, the way I got to uh, study this whole field was really um, a, couple of, a combination of different factors. Um, but my whole idea, my whole life, has been about searching for the things that make our bodies function properly. Uh, many of you know that my background is in general medicine and in oncology. And it was during the, those times that, that I began to realize that, well, there's so much more. There's so much more to what our bodies can do. And too many people died, too many people um, lost their lives and suffered unnecessary, unnecessarily because we just hadn't, we just see, well, of course, it's very important to focus on the disease, but we just didn't focus as, as much on what our bodies can do. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's not just restricted to medicine as a whole, but it's really it's everywhere from in the workplace. What's the focus on? The focus is on what the employee needs to do to be better, um, the, his, his weaknesses. The focus on the weaknesses. This part needs work. That part needs work. Uh, we, we, in medicine, we focus on disease, which is weakness. We focus on what is wrong. We focus on the negatives. I mean, what's the first word kids learn, learn, to, learn to say? No, of course. So it's always, always, always about the negatives. Always about the negatives. And so my my thing was, well, why don't we focus on what is what 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 is good, what is right? And hopefully, as we focus on what is right, as we focus on the wisdom and the power of the body, like you have in front of the screen, now um, that if we give the body what it needs, it in turn will be able to turn things around and uh, and help. It may not be able to help help totally. But it will help your drugs work better. It will, it will help your medications or whatever else that your doctor is doing work better for you. So the idea behind these webinars and behind what we do is to understand, the, uh, is, is to first of all bring up the wisdom of the body and what the body can do. And we've gone for the past six or so months, we've had a few topics that we've covered. And so here, here's an overview of all these things. They will soon be available for downloading uh, on, the, on our website. So that's, we're really excited about that. Uh, t today's call, well, we'll, we'll see. We might make, um, if, if there are enough people who want to order it, we might make DVDs available, but it, it should pay for itself. Most of these will be on the, on the websites like we talked about. But if you think about it, think about antioxidants, and, um, inflammation, fat loss, the human brain immune system, defense, aging gracefully. The one thing that, I've, that I saw in all these things is really the part like nutritionals play in this whole bunch of, uh, in, in all these things, like I said. And we're going to see that to a greater degree as we go on. The key principle, your body wants to be well. It wants to be healed. It will do everything within its power to attain that end. Another part called uh, the wisdom of the body that we we call homeostasis. Your body strives to always maintain a constant internal environment. This involves keeping the pH blood, blood pressure 
um, temperature, fat levels, ETC, ETC, all within a narrow range. It has to be within a narrow range. If it goes beyond that narrow range, sickness, disease, death, and even death could occur. So and the body is what helps to do that. It's the wisdom of the body that does that. And how, how does it do it? Well, four main things I could, I could identify. Repair or re and regeneration of cells, the regulation and coordination of the cells and systems, uh, defending against invaders, and we've covered most of these in the, our last lectures. Uh, detoxification, of course, is very, very important. Without inflammation, we would be sitting ducks. Remember, inflammation is not a disease necessarily. It is basically your body's natural way of dealing with toxins, bacteria, uh, insults to it. To it, if we if we did not have inflammation, we would never heal, and that's from one of the top researchers in the whole field of inflammation. And speaking more about the wisdom of the body, folks, uh, think about this: some parts of our bodies have so much ability to regenerate themselves. The liver, for instance, that's the, the largest organ after the skin. The, the liver is the largest organ in the body. Did you know? that you could actually resect 80%, 80% of your liver, and within months, maximum a year, the liver that, that would have grown back to its normal size. We're talking about from 20% to 100% within a year. Not, not even the worst, the most virulent malignant cell can do that. The most virulent malignant disease can do that. And your liver is able to do that. Now, other organs not as well, for instance, the, the brain and the heart are extremely restricted and limited, but it is possible in many parts to increase, to increase the ability of those organs to regenerate and to repair themselves, and that is where nutrients like glyconutritionals like come into play. Now, the whole system, as we're talking about um, the human body and everything functions at the perch at the top where this all, all these things happen, all these things work, is the human brain. And many of you have seen our PNI slides. The human, the human brain sits at the top. It controls the endocrine system and it controls the immune system, which in turn controls the, and oversees the 60 plus trillion cells in our bodies. That is what it is from the human brain that inflammation is controlled. The hum, from the human brain that free radical damage is controlled. It's from the human brain that all your hormones, your 200 plus hormones, are regulated and controlled. So the human brain is, is where it really is at. And we have uh, again, we have a DVD out on the human brain too, and that's a picture. And the key part with brain function is receiving and accurately pro processing the right kinds of information. We show this, these pictures in the previous webinars too, showing the brain getting all these, this information from different parts, from, from both within, at the bottom there, and without, through the five senses primarily. But not just that. Think, uh, we talk about the five senses, but we also, within the body, there are receptors in your blood vessels, receptors in your joints, receptors in your eyes, all getting impulses from the internal environment. And we're talking about trillions and terabytes of information being sent to your brain, and your brain is constantly, consistently processing all these things um, and responding on a split-second by split-second basis. And while it's doing all that, it still can do a lot more, like this slide shows. All right, what are we driving at here? Well, we've just mentioned and we've emphasized that the brain is probably the most important thing. Well, take a look at this slide. We have a cell to the left. Shall you can see it? Yes, I can. Okay. We have a cell to the left and uh, the outline of the human, human being to the right. And folks, I apologize. Um, I had asked Laura to get me a silhouette of a woman. I probably should have uh, emphasized what kind of woman, <laughs> but uh, this is probably going to get me get me in trouble for for showing a silhouette like this. But hey. What else is new? I get in trouble all the time. <laughs> so the point is this. You have whatever happens in the human body, whether it's the receiving of information by the brain or the responses to those that information, whether it's through the endocrine system, whether it's through the immune system, whatever happens in your body as a whole also 
also happens to the cell, the individual cell in the body. The cell is the smallest aspect, the smallest independent uh, entity of the human body. And as a matter of fact, all the characteristics, we have about seven different characteristics of the human body. All everything from reproduction to adaptation, to, I'm not going to go through them now, but the cell does all that. So really, to understand health, to understand how your body regulates, defends, uh, regenerates itself, you can't just look at the human body as a whole. We also have to look at the individual cell and what the cell needs to function. Okay, if the brain of the body, if the brain of the body is, the, is what regulates and controls the activities of the body, what then regulates and controls the activities of the individual cell? That question has to be answered before we go on. So the question is, what regulates, controls the activities of the individual cell? And here you have a, a live picture of a micro, microscopic cell, and you see uh, the nucleus there, that purple thing, the Golgi apparatus, and a couple of other things like uh, the mitochondria. And we talked about it now. We talked about that in our lecture with antioxidants. Let's look at a more simplified version. Here you go. There's the purple, the purple nucleus right in the center, the cytoplasm, and the cell membrane. Now, let's uh, for years. For years, folks, we have been trained that okay, that's the wrong one. We have been trained that the cell, <laughs> the cell was the controlling. I mean, the nucleus was the controlling part of the cell. And here, in front of you now, what some scientists did was to remove that nucleus. This is over 100 years ago. Over 100 years ago, they did an experiment and they removed the nucleus from the cell because they wanted to find out well. If the cell is the brain of the cell, then if we remove the, if the nucleus is the brain, if we remove the nucleus, the cell will not, should not be able to function. In the same way, if you, if, if I blew your brains out, you would die instantly. Your body will not be able to function. So in the same way, we, they thought that would be the same thing. But that was not what happened. Lo and behold, the cell continued to function, continued to do everything it was doing from respiration to energy production to movement to, to re, I mean, everything except one thing, reproduction. It could not reproduce itself because the DNA, <coughs> excuse me, the DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. But every other activity of the cell was well carried out even in the absence of the nucleus. Well, that left us with another question. What then controls the activities of the cell? So what they did was that they looked at the cell and then come closer. OK, there you are. They began to look at it very, very carefully. And what they did was that they found that on the surface of the cell, this red thing around the cell called the cell membrane was actually what controlled the activities. We can't go into too much of that right now. But they also found out that these hair-like projections, well, let's just call them tree-like projections. You have the stalk, that green stalk, and of course, those bluish uh, pentagons, pentagon or septagon, I don't know. OK, those bluish things, um, like diamond-shaped things, called uh, polysaccharide chains. Each of this is actually what they call uh, a monosaccharide, which means a single sugar. And we're going to get into, into that some more. But what they found out was that these tree-like structures, these tree-like structures actually acted as sense organs for the cell. Remember, we have five senses for the human body, smell, taste, touch, sight, and uh, hearing, sound. Well, we know that every animal, uh, every organism in the, in the world has, a, has, has sense organs. organs. We think about uh, some varying degree of, of expertise. Like, for instance, the mice, mice and rodents use their noses and their nostrils to sense food, to look for food. Of course, the eagle has one of the best eyesights in the world. It detects uh, its food from way off. The dogs have very good sense of smell, and also they have very, very good hearing. Um, whales in the ocean can hear um, frequencies much, much lower than we and higher than we can. So every, every different animal has its own 
specialized form of sense organ. Whatever happens, we everybody has to be able to receive impulses. If if one of us five senses as human beings were lost, well, the other four would compensate for it. If all five were lost, you would not be alive. Simple. You would not be alive because your cell, you have no information to respond to. If it doesn't, it is not sensitive to information. It dies. That's all there is to it. That is just all there is to it. So in the same way, the cell, like I said, has, all right, so back to what we're looking at, this, that's the cell. So the brain of the cell is this circular thing around it called the cell membrane, and those tree stalks are all over the cell's surface. So this, if you think about um, cell development, embryology, how the human being develops from, from one cell to several different cells, at a certain point in em the embryological stage of, of, of body development, there are three layers. One is, the most outer one is called the ectoderm, and then the other two are the mesoderm and the endoderm. The ectoderm, out of the ectoderm come only two systems, the brain and the, think about it that way, it's not too far-fetched to think that the brain of the cell is actually the skin of the cell called the cell membrane. I hope that makes, does that kind of make sense, Terry? Yes, it does. So are you also saying that those tree-like things are part of the brain of the cell? They are, the, yes, they are part of the brain of the cell, just okay. as your sense organ. Extensions. Let's make it, let's, let's make it this, the, the extensions of the brain of your cell, but they're intricately connected to the brain of the cell. Just like your eye is connected to the brain by the optic nerve, and um, your ear too is connected to the brain by the by I think what one of the what the nerve is called. It's one of the cranial nerves. In the same way, the these the thing structures. that interacts with the environment and sends messages to the brain. Correct. Okay. Correct. So the real brain is the cell membrane, and then those those stalks are called the the the, the sense organs. Okay. All right, uh, we, we talked about, we, we showed that at one time the PNI slide, uh, the different systems. Well, again, the immune system is the one that is most in, in the body, and I have a picture here that shows that. If the immune system is working, you have a good chance that you're going to live a healthy life. Uh, you may not be all that smart. You may not be a very successful person, but the immune system is really what uh, goes around the cells of the immune system, go around the body, and they, they, check, they check around. They check around for problems. How uh, they have to communicate with the immune system, telling the immune system um, their moment by moment status. If the, if the cell needs something, it has to be able to communicate that problem to the immune system. If the cell does not, if the cell cannot communicate that problem to the immune system, uh, that cell usually dies. Okay, so there you have it, the importance of communication. I'm going to get to that some more. And of course, we have this picture where we, which we can kind of like show the. Um, a graphical representation of the 167 different cells that are part of the immune system. These are only five of them. Immune cell actually interacts with all the couple of organs, the digestive system right there, the, the kidneys, the brain, the heart, the liver. If they're able to find out what that problem is and relay that to the appropriate centers. All problems, all health challenges start because the immune system is either unable to detect what that problem is, the cell may not the the, the cell that is has a problem may not be able knows what the problem is. It detects what the problem is, but it is powerless to mount up an attack and destroy if it is a virus or bacteria. So the question of both sensing the problem and dealing with the problem that is really where over ninety five percent of our problems in, in health come from. So, Dave, yep. What do those circles and arrows in the center of that cell represent? Um, basically, basically that the, the cell is, is receiving information, is processing the information. It's kind of like what I do with the brain. The okay. cell is processing information and responding to it. That does not answer your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. From Corinthians, it says, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? Well, in the same way, if you look at the immune system, if the immune system doesn't get clear impulses, it doesn't get a clear signal, if it doesn't know that this, this virus is dangerous and it's going to destroy of an attack, well, uh, disease is going to happen. So that's why it's so important. And really, the immune system, um, this, the whole story of glycobiology and glyconutrients with the sugar, the eight important sugars, all started with the immune system. Um, researchers, I think it was a, a company, a pharmaceutical company, hired a man by the name of Dr. Bill McInerney, who is a research pharmaceutical vera. We've all heard about aloe vera. Uh, it's in skin products. It's in everything from skin products to nutritional products. You wanted to find out why aloe vera was so effective in so many conditions, and so including burns, skin burns. 
And so they had him to find out what was the, the, the active ingredient. And lo and behold, as he searched, he found out that the active ingredient was actually a monosaccharide or a sugar. <coughs> now, that was shocking 20 years ago because uh, science had established that, well, sugars are needed for only one thing, and that is for the production of energy, nothing else. And so when he came up with this idea, they were, he was ridiculed, and actually he uh, got, got along with, he, came, he, he found out, or he worked with another doctor, this, he, in this case a pathologist, a medic, an MD, called Dr. Reg Mac, McDaniel. <coughs> and so they both presented this case to the scientists and the authority, authorities in medicine, and again, they were ridiculed because they, we had, they had already established that sugars are for energy. Well, they found out that these sugars, especially the mannose, mannose is one of is the sugar they actually did the research on and they discovered was the active ingredient in aloe vera. So what they did was that, well, they began to, since they went, paid attention to this, they decided to study mannose some more and they found out that mannose, the sugar, was actually the active ingredient or the active sugar that helped the macrophages. The macrophages function uh, like they should. And I, let me show you that picture real quick should come a little faster. Okay, let's look at that cell again. The macrophage, that's this big guy. Um, if the, the founder of the macrophage, which really is one of the most important cells in the immune system, if not the most important, it uses mannose a lot to detect uh, problems. It, the macrophage is called big eater. It gobbles up um, dead cells. It deals with the viruses and, 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 and bad cells. And so they found out that the macrophage really, really needed mannose to function. So really this is a tale of three Macs, Dr. McAnally, Dr. McDaniel, and, Dr. and of course the macrophage. <laughs> but they became the first researchers in history to, let me read this properly, to recognize that the body could benefit from a supplemental blend of nutritional saccharides. And so that's where the story of, of glycobiology begins. And soon afterwards, uh, the I think this was the 24th edition of our, the biochemistry textbook, the textbook that many of us in the medical students around the world read. I mean, I had to read that as a medical student um, by the senior editor, Dr. Robert Murray, and a whole chapter that Dr. Murray wrote was actually a whole chapter that's devoted to glycoprotein. Glyco means sugar, proteins mean, of course, proteins. And he showed in that chapter that these eight sugars are vital for the function of every single cell in the body. And so, you, really, you, don't, you just don't get a better validation than that um, from one of the top researchers, from one of the top um, the authorities in medicine in the world. And we're, go we're going to be having the privilege of having him on our webinar next Thursday to teach about uh, uh, malignancies. Okay, so you need to be on that, on that too. Um, information is on our website. Okay, and so what else came? On average, okay. There are two obstacles to vibrant health and longevity, ignorance and complacency. We have, we have just put that in just for you to understand. Health must start with knowledge and information. Okay, there are the cells again. And before I go on to really talk about glyconutritionals and what they do, we have to remember that they are part of seven different food groups. If I were to choose one food group, one special class of nutrients, and I'm not just saying this because a uh, doctor goes on the call or I'm trying, oh, for whatever reason. If I were to choose one food group, it would be the glyconutritionals, and um, we'll be explaining more about, about that later on. But there are seven food groups, um, vitamins, water, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids, which are, of course, are very, very important, and uh, sugars and the phytochemicals. But really, really, why do I choose glyconutrients? Well, because for all these other nutrients to work, for them to do their job, they absolutely, absolutely have to have the sugars to help them do their job. I'm going to explain that to you some, well, uh, some, sometime later. Um, the reason, real quick, is that receptors, receptors before the cell, again, the sense organ concept, the sense organ before the, your human body can take in anything, it has to sense it, it has to taste it, feel it, touch it before it can ingest it. Uh, even food, you have to taste it, feel it, touch it before you can ingest it. In the same way, before a cell can take in fatty acids, for instance, or take in phytochemicals, for instance, it has to have the receptor to receive it into the body, even glucose. And we talked about um, 
fat loss, in one of our fat loss programs, we talk about how the cell has to t take in insulin, which eventually helps it take in glucose before it can get in energy. All this happens through receptors, and that is one of the reasons why. Of all the, the seven, I would choose glyconutrients. Okay, let's talk about that some more. And I have this really nice quote from a, C a former CEO of a company that produced the glyconutritionals. Um, here's the point, and I like the quote. The miracle is not in glyconutrients. The miracle is in the design of the human body to keep itself healthy if it is supported with the right nutrients and glyconutritionals or the glyconutrients are simply the latest discovery of a new category of total nutrients. Great. Okay, um, and here's what it comes down to, folks. Here's, here's what it comes down to. There are eight sugars, all mono monosaccharides. Two of them are abundant in our diet. Those two are glucose and galactose. The other six, and we're going to show you the six of them, the other six are not. But because the body so much needs to have these sugars, there's a backup system. Um, so, but that backup, backup system is sometimes very expensive in terms of energy and expenditure. The body has a way of producing the other six from the two that are present in the diet. Again, in some cases, it takes between 15 to 34 different enzymatic reactions to do that. That takes a huge toll on the human body. So it just makes sense. It just makes sense for you to be able to give it either in the diet, which is very difficult, or as a supplement, which is why we're talking about this today. Um, a, 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 quick, a quick point, a case in point, is that at the turn of the century, we had about 90... Um, we are, okay, let me put it this way. Most of these sugars come from plants. In fact, all of these sugars come from plants. Now think about this. 97% of the plants, of the agricultural food products that we used to farm in this country at the turn of the, tw of the 19th, no, turn of the 20th century in the, in the 1900s, 97% are no longer planted. So we're down to about 3% in the 21st century of the food groups we used to eat. So therefore, if, it, if the variety has reduced, it also means that the, uh, the availability of these sugars, among other things, has reduced too. Of course, there's a lot more to it, including um, agricultural practices, green harvesting, genetic engineering, all these things all come together. Of course, food processing, food processing all come together to restrict uh, the availability of these sugars, again, among other things to the average American, average human being, really. And also, I just mentioned that the body can produce the other six, but the problem is not only does it take a lot of energy, but there are also toxins that actually interfere with that conversation, that conversion process. And I listed uh, the five main categories of, of things that actually restrict our body's ability to produce those other sugars. So again, it just makes sense for us to be able to have them in a ready form in a nutritional um, supplemental product. And here are the big eight. Mannose, fucose, glucose, galactose, xylose, N-acetylglucosamine, N-acetylgalactosamine, and N-acetylneuraminic acid, which is actually very, very important for brain function. Okay. Other names they're known as uh, biological sugars, monosaccharides, necessary sugars, necessary carbohydrates, and of course poly polysaccharides. They are part of the polysaccharide chain. Poly means many, saccharides means sugars. Again, here are the big eight. What else are they, what are they important for? Well, we mentioned cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, extremely important, and we're going to uh, bring out some more um, slides to show you why that is important. But adhesion. What does adhesion have to do with, it, with anything? Well, let me explain that. Uh, cells have to stick together. Cells have to stay in close contact. Liver cells have to stick together with liver cells. Um, kidney cells have to stick together with kidney cells. Same thing with brain cells. You don't want a brain cell moving from the brain to the liver, for instance. That only happens with one condition, only one condition. 
And we all know what that condition is. And that process of removal from one place to the other is what kills most people in that condition. All right. <laughs> We're going to talk about that condition in a, in a week's time. But uh, immune function and optimal health. Uh, we alluded to that when we talked about how the immune cell goes around the body. It gets information, and it sends information, and, and also mounts up. It acts like an army to destroy invaders and toxins. Of course, cell tissue, cell tissue repair and organ function. Uh, quick, quick case in point. If a cell is damaged, it needs, it needs both internal communication and external communication. If a cell is damaged, let's say the mitochondria, for instance, Signals have to be sent to the nucleus to be able to produce, uh, re repair that damage, produce the, sugar, the, the amino acids or proteins that will be sent to the kind of spare parts, we call them spare parts, to repair that damage in the mitochondria. The way that communication happens is also, <coughs> or to a very large extent, through the use of sugars. Even, we mentioned the DNA, even within the DNA, and Dr. Murray's class, he, he actually gave a, gave a talk on glyconutritionals and glycobiology, and he explained this, and I had heard this, for, I basically was hearing this for the first time, even the DNA, about 50%, imagine that, 50% of the DNA is actually made up of, believe it or not, sugars. So these sugars play a huge, huge role in everything that goes on in our bodies. Okay, next slide. And again, here yeah, we have a lot of validation in several different top journal, journals and magazines. Um, here is Nature, um, top scientific journal. I didn't mean to say magazines, but top scientific journal. Okay, up here it says surface carbohydrates on a cell serve as points of attachment for other cells, infectious bacteria, viruses, toxins, hormones, and many other molecules. And there you see the surface of the cell right there. Uh, let's look at a, a larger cell. Okay, um, larger picture, I mean. And you see a larger picture here, uh, right on the surface, you see the cell membrane. And then you see these green stalks sticking through the membrane into the cell. Those are the protein or fat, um, fatty acid or fat chains. But on the surface, on the, like the branches of a tree, these reddish-like circles or marble-like things, are actually sugars, which are the first to come in contact with whatever is on the external. Again, your sense organs. Again, the first thing that your body comes in contact with, it comes in contact with it through sense organs. So in the same way with the cell. Let's look at another slide. This was a slide I really I pilfered from Dr. Murray's um, side presentation, but this is kind of like, like uh, simplifies it some more. You have two cells attached to each other. The cell on the left, um, this, okay, you have uh, the legend there says the CAM is the cell adhesion molecule, and that's what the sugars help the cells to adhere to each other. And of course, dr hormones, drugs, think about this. Many Americans take five plus different medications. Without well-functioning um, glycoprotein chains, and these R's stand for the receptors. Without well-functioning glycoprotein chains, those drugs that you're taking will not work. So it's crucial, even with medication. So that's why we say this is not a replacement for your medication. This is really helps. It really helps to make your medications work better. Next slide. And yeah, I just have a few <laughs> pictorial views of uh, what adhesion does. And you see the cells all standing across a gorge, all hanging to each other for dear life. And that guy doesn't have enough sugars in his body. Actually, fucose, one of the eight sugars, is what helps um, adhesion the most. And you see it's, it's big, uh, he's in a very uncomfortable position. And next slide, bang, he drops to the ground and he is impaled <laughs> because it doesn't have enough sugars and it's basically it's dead. <laughs> so adhesion is very important. Again, you've probably seen this slide before. And immune function, we know the immune, is, the immune system is an army. And there you have the drill sergeant right there. He's making these guys all work very, very hard training because your body is constantly being bombarded by all kinds of things. And so your body has to be always on the ready, always ready to defend and attack. Um, and there, that's why you also have this guy collecting data all the time because uh, when your immune system faces a challenge, 
it remembers your immune system and your nervous system are the only two systems out of the 11 plus different systems you have in your body that actually remembers and codes and responds in, in the future to similar circumstances. No other system in your body can do that kind of thing and your immune system is really the, has its, a brain of its own which it uses to communicate. Okay? David? Yeah. So is it the sugars on the cells that cause them to adhere to each other? Yes. The sugars on the cells. Now there are other things also that help that help the sugars that help the cells to adhere to each other. But yes, the sugars on the cell help them to ad adhere to each other. And as they adhere to each other, that strengthens the immune system. Uh, no, I'm I'm actually shifted from ad adhesion now to basically the immune system function. Oh, okay, thanks. Sure. Um, I'm talking about more about in terms of immune system function, communication, how the immune system functions as an army. And of course, this picture kind of like brings all brings all that in a hopefully humorous way. What else, what else are sugars important for? Is it just uh, communication, immune system function, uh, adhesion? Well, on their own, that's how would say that those are pretty important functions. But sugars do a lot more than that. Let me give you another example. Um, before. Uh, sperm cell, and we're talking about fertilization now, before a sperm cell can fertilize an ovum, the sperm cell has to find the ovum. And we're talking about millions and millions of, of sperm cells that are poured in and they, they search. Only one or maybe two at most get into the ovum. Again, the sperm cell is a cell, so on its surface are receptors. So also is the ovum on its receptors, on its cell, are receptors. For fertilization to occur, those sugars must be in place. And it even goes further than that. For that cell, that newly formed cell that is composed of both the ovum and the sperm, for that cell to start dividing and dif differentiating itself and for to form systems, organs, and tissues, for it to happen, those sugars play a, a huge role in directing the whole activity from fertilization all the way to complete the complete human baby that comes out after nine months. Are you, are you getting to see the point? Yes. The importance of these? Yes. So well, the amount of sugars that the um, sperm had and the ovum have affect the amount of uh, sugars that are available on the cells of the new forming embryo? Um, I wouldn't... Uh, or is that yeah, from I, the mother, what, what the mother would be? Uh, let, let, me put, let me put it this way. Um, if the, the, the mother, the human, the, the mother doesn't have enough of these, um, if the mother isn't either creating enough of the, of the sugars or is not um, um, having enough supplement, enough in terms of the diet or supplementation, if the mother isn't having enough of that or if the father isn't having enough of that, the, every cell in the body will it will be deficient in most in most cells in the body. Now, now deficiency is, is a relative term. I mean, if if you don't have, it, it's impossible not to have the sugars on the cell surface because if you don't have the sugars on the cell surface, you will be dead. But many people are really deficient in optimal amounts of those sugars, and that ap applies to every cell in the body, including the sperm cell. So if the, if the sperm cell doesn't have either enough of the uh, the sugars on its cell surface, or this, those sugars are not, or the receptors are not functioning well for some reason or the other, and say same thing with the ovum or the ova, if those receptors are either not functioning well or they're not enough, it may be more difficult for them to find and fertilize. Hmm. And aren't, aren't some of those sugars found in breast milk, human breast milk? Uh, absolutely, and we're, go we're going to get that to that in, I think, the next few slides. But here's a quick here's a quick trivia for you guys. Well, let me ask you, Sherry. What is the smallest, the largest cell in the body? The largest cell. The largest cell, the largest human cell known. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's the ovum, the female, the the ovum. That that cell you're looking at at the top left of the screen is the largest human cell known. Let me ask you another question. What is the smallest human cell known? Is it the sperm? <laughs> right. <laughs> so the sperm cell is the smallest human cell known. 
Uh, and they say they're the weaker sex. Mm. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, Sherry did mention something about the breast milk. Think about it, folks. When, you, when it comes to nutrition, nothing is more basic than breast milk. We have found out that five of the eight sugars these that we mentioned are in your breast milk. And let me just show you the next slide. These underlined there are oligosaccharides. Oligo means few, which would mean anything from three to about ten. And we mentioned like five. In some cases, they found up to seven of these eight sugars in breast milk. Oligosaccharides are not found in any other type of breast milk, any other mammalian breast milk. They are found only in human breast milk. Mm. So when people ask, well, is this safe? Is this safe for us? Um, are, are, is, this, uh, is are sugar safe? Well, um, the, the case is the case in point is this: if it's safe for the newborn baby, baby, I think it's a good chance that it's safe for the adults. <coughs> now, here's another thing I wanted to mention in in, in advance: that the lipids, <coughs> lipids are fatty acids. The the brain, the human brain, needs uh, is made up of about sixty percent, sixty percent of it is made up of fatty acids and lipids of fatty acids. Your human brain absolutely needs uh, fatty acids to function. Of all mammals, mammals, we have, as human beings, have the largest brains. And this ratio, 30 to 45 grams of lipids in the breast milk, is the largest by far than any other than cow breast milk or, um, or goat breast milk. So in every regard, and of course, we have um, the, the Antibodies from the mother also are part of the breast milk. So in every regard, human breast milk is superior. And I mentioned this at one of my seminars. And someone walks up to me after the class and says, well, did you know that 90% uh, of the top Fortune 500 CEOs actually were breast breastfed? And I said, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> but that's <laughs> it's good to know that, too. So uh, breast milk, and that underscores the point that human um, kids, human beings who are raised on breast milk, human breast milk, are as a rule smarter, more educationally, and more emotionally stable and healthier than those who are not raised on breast, um, human breast milk. And those sugars, oligosaccharides, play a key role in that. Okay. Of course, along with the other ones too. Another thing that startles me, oh my goodness, I, I, was, I was amazed when I heard this from Dr. Murray, and of course, he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's an authority in this field. So here's what it is. We have um, four main types of blood groups. We've got the A, the B, the AB, and the O. The O, of course, is a universal donor, and the AB is a universal acceptor, which means that the O can give, can give anybody with blood group O can give somebody else with A or B or AB blood, um, blood group O, hopefully without any, any kind of reaction. But here's a molecular biochemical reason why if you give someone with blood group B, blood group A blood will probably react or even die. And the reason is this, and you don't need to worry about everything else before this line I'm drawing from the top with my arrow to the bottom. To the right of that line, the end of this whole structure called the A antigen is called is 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 um, topped. The end is actually a sugar called N-acetylgalactosamine, one of the eight sugars. The only thing that makes it different from the B antigen is that the B antigen has N-acetyl no, it has only galactose. So one has N-acetylgalactosamine, the other one has galactose. This small difference can mean the difference between life and death in many cases. Very important. And so when you look at this, you see O doesn't even have any of those. And that's why you can give someone with A, B, or A, B, O, and not suffer uh, the repercussions. Of course, there are other things that, are, that we have to check out for. But as a general rule, O, o, o is a safer kind of blood to give than A or B. Make sense? Okay. All right, well, we're going we're to keep on going. And um, 
Um, next, glyconutritionals and the GI tract. Um, what else are glyco glyconutritionals important in? Okay, 70% of the immune system is in the gut. 70% of the immune system. Think about that. And we, we, may, we mentioned that the immune system is what helps to regulate the activities. The immune system is what helps to protect. It's the one thing that keeps you healthy. And 70% of that, that is in the gut. Well, um, one of the things that make the immune system function well is because the bacteria, there are good bacteria that help to strengthen the immune system. So not all bacteria is bad. There are certain good bacteria that our bodies must have. And really, the ratio is about 85% to 15%. 85% of good bacteria to about 15% of bad bacteria. Even E. coli, which we were all scared of, E. coli, for instance, does have its, its good uses in the body. But 85% of the good, like I said, 85% has to be um, good bacteria. Now, in certain conditions or in antibiotic, when people overuse antibiotics, that ratio is distorted because the bacteria destroy the, the good bacteria and many times the bad bacteria too. So antibiotics do not not use antibiotics for over an overly extended period of time. Okay, uh, so glyconutritionals actually act uh, as uh, food for the good bacteria. And that's why they are called prebiotics. Prebiotics simply means that the food for good bacteria. And good bacteria is called, called probiotics. As you grow older, you need, um, you, you are, your body actually loses a lot of these good bacteria. And so it just makes sense um, as you grow older to also not only feed the good bacteria, but also um, in some cases take in um, probiotic supplements. And there are some good ones, good ones out there. Fiber is so important because it keeps the, the GI tract um, um, clean and healthy. There are many conditions of the GI tract that can be reduced or, or prevented by having a high fiber diet. In the United States, we have less than 15 grams a day. The average person takes less than 15 grams a day of fiber as opposed to um, other countries like um, South Africa, for instance, they take about 100 grams a day of fiber, and that really helps to protect them. So fiber, please, if there's anything you want to add to your diet, make sure you take a lot of fiber. And of course, fiber is found in mostly in fruits and veggies. All right, next slide, let's see if we can go. Okay. I also mentioned um, I wanted to free radical damage. That's a huge, a huge field. And uh, we did a talk on antibiotics and antioxidants. 73% uh, of all premature deaths or death is due to oxidative stress. Remember, your body produces free radicals, even from normal metabolism, but also from the air, the water, the food, uh, interactions. I mean, even radio, ra radiation, even chemicals, drugs, radiotherapy, these all produce free radicals and that can damage your cells. As a matter of fact, they found out, most researchers believe that the aging process, the weakness that we experience is primarily, primarily due to the effect of free radicals on the cells of your body. And this is Lester Packer who said this. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, we mentioned a few of the different antioxidants in the body, but a few of the different antioxidants are very important for your health. But we also mentioned that this number five, glucathione, is really the master antioxidant, the most important antioxidant, because it is the antioxidant that is in the cell. That is what is, that is, it works mostly in the cell. And of course, your cell has to be protected from within. Uh, another thing that they found out in research was that the, uh, the mitochondria, which are the energy producing plants in your body, the energy plants in your body, the mitochondria actually um, are what it is damaged to the mitochondria that is responsible for the weakness and the aging process more than anything else. And so if you have enough glutathione in the body, it actually helps to protect the mitochondria. Okay? Um, but how does glyco how do glyconutrients help that? Well, check this out. In a scientific study, a uh, complex consisting of the eight vital sugars raised glutathione levels in healthy tissue by over by about 20%, and they protected against depletion of glutathione by about 50% when subjected to direct toxic chemical assault. Isn't that amazing? 
So glyconutrients really help in, in free radical formation too. Hi there, Sherry? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, what else? I, mean, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, folks, but yeah, we're going to go through a lot of stuff with glyconutritionals, and um, if you have to leave, we understand. We shall make this available in some form or the other. Aging, fat gain, fat loss, prioritization rationing, stem cell proliferation. Well, here's, let me talk about prioritization or rationing uh, for a minute. I'm from a country where you never have 24-hour-a-day electricity. It's, it's impossible, unheard of. Most people have to buy generators to, to keep electricity going. So uh, basically, there has to be a lot of rationing, a lot of prioritization. So let's say from, from the hours of 12 noon to about 4 p.m., this part of the city has electricity. And then after 4 p.m., it's shifted to another part of the city. And that's that way, hopefully, food doesn't get spoiled. Nobody goes crazy because um, try and rush, rush on the electricity and the NEPA. Um, now, in the same way, as we grow older, especially, your body begins to prioritize. It begins to um, find out, it begins to focus on the parts that need uh, nutrients, that need blood flow the most. And that's, of course, because um, as you grow older, the machine, the machinery of your body wears and tears. And so uh, the nutrients, <coughs> the nutrients the, are not as available as they used to, and your body is not making use of them as they used to. And a good example is your body becomes resistant to insulin as you grow older. That's just a rule. Your body becomes resistant to insulin. You can reduce the level of resistance, but you really are getting more resistant. So in the same way, your body, because it is wise, your body uses its wisdom to to um, to ration, to prioritize, to see which ones, which parts are more important. That's why you could have uh, a process going on in your body and you don't know about it, but you have this pain in your knee and it's like hurting so much. Well, because the body thinks that that process that is going on that you don't know anything about, your body is trying to direct resources to deal with that process. And yeah, you have a pain in your knee, but your knee isn't that important. I mean, you can have it, God forbid, but without a knee or without a leg, you can live, but you can't live too much without a heart, without a brain. So your body switches resources to help deal with those problems. So I'm basically trying to just show you how things work. The, case, the thing is this, if we could increase, if we could uh, improve your body's ability to, to, to communicate, to interact, to prioritize, and also give your body more resources, then its job becomes easier. And that's where glyconutritionals also come into play. Stem cell proliferation, your body already produces stem cells. Let me give you an example. If there's a damage, if there's damage to your blood vessel at any time, um, the macrophages, which are the first to find out what that damage is, the macrophages, which are the immune cells, send signals to the bone marrow to, uh, to uh, produce more, um, to produce stem cells that will actually help to repair that damage. Again, communication plays a part. So the, 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 the macrophages send those signals to the, the bone marrow. Now, um, what the bone marrow does is produce stem cells, like I said. Researchers have found out that that production can be upped, increased to about eight times of normal in the normal human body. So the body's already produced stem cells. What we know is that that ability to produce stem cells can be enhanced with glyconutritionals. David, can no you question. remind us what um, stem cells are and what they do, why they're important? Sure, sure, sure. Um, anyway, um, stem cells are like the basic, they are, they are, they are what we would call undifferentiated cells. Now, like, um, how would I, like building, okay, no, that's, that's not what, what best way to put it. Okay, stem cells are cells that, if you, in the body, that can help to replace damaged or lost cells. They're basically premature cells that, if called upon, can be stimulated to repair or replace a cell. Like, for instance, now the brain. Uh, we, for many years, we were told that the brain cannot um, regenerate. If there's damage to a certain brain tissue, for the most part, that damage is going to remain permanent because your brain does not make new cells. That is not true anymore. There are about four parts in the brain, four 
centers in the brain that actually produce stem cells that can actually replace damaged cells that are damaged. So stem cells, again, are uh, premature cells which can, on stimulation, grow to f replace any part of the body. But as you grow older, they can grow to replace any part of the organ where they're found. For instance, the stem cells in the brain uh, can only reproduce and, pr and replace brain nerve cells brain or nerve cells. Um, stem cells in the, in, the, in the skin can grow and, repro and replace several skin cells. Now there are several different kinds of skin cells. Skin cells. That stem cell there is a premature or uh, undifferentiated skin cell that can grow and reproduce and replace the damaged skin or one of the many different kinds of damaged skin cells. Make sense? Yeah, so you're saying the glyconutrients in increase the production of stem cells in your bone marrow, and those stem cells then can become like brain cells or heart cells or skin cells or whatever you need? Well, well, well what I'm saying is that your body it already does that in different parts of the, in different parts, like, like the brain and all that. What I'm saying is that primarily your body increase, you know, it's like a nutrient, increase your body's ability to do many things, including the formation of stem cells. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, uh, let's talk about aging a little bit. Okay, we also have a DVD on grading, aging gracefully. And here you have a picture. Thanks for sending this, Sherry. Here you have a picture of a child growing through the stages to old age. All right. With medicine has found out about eight different biomarkers, what they call biomarkers basically means that these indicate how, whether or not, um, how old the person is chronologically. So if people look at what each of these eight, well, parameters, they will, they will tell how old the person is. Well, uh, as you grow older, they found out that, well, you, um, your, basic meta your metabolic rate sl slows down, which is, of course, why you get fat or you, you, you gain fat. Um, your muscle mass decreases, your blood pressure increases, aerobic capacity, which means the, the ability of your body, to, your body to take in oxygen reduces, your blood sugar or insulin, your blood sugar uh, tolerance uh, reduces, or your insulin, your insulin, uh, what's, the, what's the word now, insulin resistance really, insulin resistance in increases, cholesterol levels increase, bone density decreases, ability to stabilize, stabilize blood body temperature also reduces. But, let me go back again, but they have found out that oh, about six of these different biomarkers can be improved as your body has good nutrition, especially with glyconutritionals. And here's a quote by uh, an authority, really, in this whole nutritional field, and here's what he says. Uh, you, you can Google him. He's a really well-known authority. Uh, he, he says, remedying micronutrient deficiencies is likely to lead to a major improvement in health and an increase in longevity at low cost. Well, think about that. Think about the amount of money baby, baby boomers and people older than them are, are spending to, to, today on all kinds of um, surgery, surgical procedures and some things that are not too safe. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, that, well, if you get the right kind, the right quality of nutrients, you can actually um, gain a lot of those things that people are paying so much money for. So uh, I, I always advocate working, starting with the most natural and the most beneficial to your body before you go into spending some major, major money on sometimes dangerous procedures. All right. Uh, so, glyconutrients also help in the aging process. What else do they do? Well, uh, several other things. Antibody formation, antibody functions. Uh, your body produces antibodies to deal with toxins and bacteria. Excuse me, I had, had to get a drink. Arthritis is, is, is one of the <coughs> damage to the joints is one of the main reasons for um, disability at work. and we know that sugar <coughs> sugar chains are really implicated in joint problems. If you can help, um, if 
you can help with uh, sugar, the sugar solution, so to speak. You, you can help um, give your body the right amount of, sh of sugars, the right kinds of sugars, then your body will be able to repair damaged cartilage. Okay, collagen too is a, is a glycoprotein, and sugars play a huge part, part in it. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize here when it comes to collagen, collagen is what's in your skin. Collagen is what gives your skin that strength, that tensile strength. As a matter of fact, because if you were to compare a strand of collagen with a strand of steel, steel, um, the strand of collagen would trump the last strand of steel any day of the week and twice on Sunday. It is oh, so much. Huh? That's amazing. It is, yeah, yeah, it is so much stronger, collagen is, than steel is. So it's a very, very powerful thing. Uh, collagen is, like I said, it's, it's, it's in the skin. Um, but as you grow older, again, uh, collagen stores, reduces um, vitamin C is what helps to make the collagen strong. And that's why people, soldiers who, who lack vitamin C on the books in, in the 16th, 17th centuries died because the because they were not able to make the collagen strong. I mean, without vitamin C, you have collagen, but vitamin C is what provides the well the tools to um, the nutrients necessary to make the collagen. It's kind of like cement. Cement is liquid, but when it dries, it becomes strong. Well, uh, without co without vitamin C, collagen is is very weak. But with vitamin C, it's like an enzyme. It acts activates to make the collagen very very strong and and, and firm. Uh, again, as you grow older, that your collagen stores diminish, but it can help to reverse that too with good nutrition. Here's a quote. Uh, One of the most important functions of, of glyconutrients is keeping our cells together, cartilage cells with cartilage cells, liver cells with liver cells, and so on. Sugars mediate these tight adhesions. This is Dr. John Rollins. He was actually the one who actually looked at the patent when they first decided to put together a sugar complex, this company did. He is the one who looked at the patent and saw that, wow, this, there's something in here. And he helped to approve the patent of the combination of the eight sugars. And uh, he's a researcher. And he's a bio biochemical researcher, too. And this is what he found out. Um, there is a very interesting book that's out there, and I want to encourage you. We're going to show you the um, how to how to get it, folks. But uh, many of you know who Dr. Jill Gil Cates is. He's been researching um, people who have been on my glyconutrient products products now for 14 years. He has uh, examined them. He has checked them for, for different uh, on the different factors, parameters from bone density to um, energy and all those things, about five things. We're going to show that slide in a minute. And he looked at all these things um, on people who are on these sugar supplements. And he came up with some very, very important research. And this, most of that research is, is in his book. However, he gave us about 55 slides, um, all from the book, and showing all the different research that he has done. And on those slides, he, like I said, he gave that to us, and we've actually made a PDF out of it. So that is available on our website for a very, little, very, very low price, and um, he, he made that available to us. Um, I'm going to show you how to get his book in a minute, but let's look at some of the things. Um, he has a table of contents. I won't spend time there. Um, these five things here are what he found out about how the about how these sugars have helped, and I'm going to show you, yeah, right here. The final results, final results are from this 14-year study, and of course, he had to be very compliant, but basically, this tells the story. Glyconutritionals improve bone health by increasing mineral density, also by aiding in the reduction of excess body fat. Hey, hey, what are we talking about? Fat loss. Um, they help in to maintain or increase lean muscle mass. Remember, the first three, the first three are they, they are what we call body composition. If you want to lose weight, you have to have all these three in place over a long period of time. I mean, you can we can lose weight for for two months, but you're going to get it back if you do not pay attention to these three top three. Okay, increase self-reported quality of life, and you can take that to 
mean a lot of things. <laughs> okay, and of course, uh, improved immune health as, as measured by C-reactive protein. That ha this has a lot to do with in inflammation and immune function. And so that's what he found out. Again, you can go to you can either call him on this number two one zero eight two four four two zero zero, and um, you can order order the book. I strongly urge you to to get it if you are someone trying to, to convince people about the importance of these sugars. Glyconutrients and the genes. This is another interesting topic that I, I was really fascinated about. And here's, here's, here's something, folks. Um, have you ever wondered, Sherry, for instance, have you ever wondered why twins you can have uh, identical twins, which means they came from the same egg and same sperm? Have you ever wondered why one will have an introvertish, will be an introvert personality-wise? And the other person will be an extrovert. Yeah, they can look so much alike, but have very different personalities. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I, I I know a couple of twins. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, I know I know two and one, one pair in particular. I mean, he, one of them is. Um, I mean, they look identical, but one of them uses glasses, the other one doesn't. One is left-handed, the other one isn't. Um, Personality-wise, they're very very different. And I, was, I mean, these are things I've always, I've always wondered about because if they come from the same sperm and the same egg, then their DNA should be exactly identical and therefore they should have exactly the same behavior in every way because we've been told that the gene is it. Once your DNA, um, once it is in your DNA, it's most likely going to have it. I mean, that just applies even to disease. Like, for instance, people have mastectomies because they have a certain gene that will make them have that problem. And they're like, well, my mother went through it, my grandmother went through it, I don't want to go the same pain and suffering. And so to prevent that, they do a mastectomy. And that's just an example. Um, but we're now we're finding out, we're finding out that genes don't really regulate all that. The genes are not, the fact that you have it in your genes or in your DNA does not mean that's what's going to happen to you in real life because your cell can actually repair that damage those genes can be, bad genes can be covered up, um, good genes can be expressed, bad genes cannot be will, will not be expressed. There are so many things that are involved in this whole thing that you cannot just say because it's in my genes, this is what's going to happen. They are now finding out that one single gene, we used to think before the Human Genome Pro Project in 2001, they used to think that we would have about 3,000 different genes, and 300,000, excuse me, 300,000 different genes because of all the different uh, expressions in the human body, all the different things that we have. So we thought, thought we were going to have 300,000 different genes. Well, after the study, they found out we had between 25,000 and 30,000. From 300,000 to 25,000 and 30,000, or 30,000 at most. Why? And think about this. Some plants, some plants have more genes, have a larger g um, genome is actually the collection of our genes. Some plants have a larger genome, which means they have much more genes than human beings have. Can you imagine that? Um, the one difference between, uh, the, the difference in our genome between, the difference between a chimpanzee's genome and a human being's genome is, they say, about 1.4%. And yet, the difference between me and a chimpanzee, I think it's, I think it's a huge, I hope there's a huge difference between us. But what I'm trying to say is that these, the, the gene is not, um, does not control everything that is expressed. Now, having said that, I will say this, that one gene can actually, uh, it, it can actually have 2,000 different expressions based on the impulses that your cell receives from the external environment, based on what your cell, the information your cell gets through its sense organs and through its brain, your cell can say what gene is expressed, what gene should not be expressed. And there's a lot involved in it. But here's something from Acta Anatomica, and that's, this is one of the top three journals, medical journals in the world. And so here's what they said. A, a part Part of the reason our genome is so small is because of the added functions provided by sugars. So sugars actually regulate the expression of genes. Very, very important. Another thing we're finding out about sugars is that 
we can actually look at different conditions and find out which sugars are missing or which sugars are absent or deficient. And actually, in many cases, some genetic conditions are actually correcting, helping to correct some genetic, genetic conditions by adding sugars. Probably we're going to do another class where we actually talk about um, specific health conditions and what the part sugars can play. Now, not as a treatment, but as something to help strengthen your cells. Because most most problems are usually, in most problems, there's a deficiency there somewhere. So we're talking about while your doctor is taking care of your disease, you take care of your health by dealing with the deficiencies, dealing with the abnormalities in your nutrition. And everybody's nutrition really um, leaves a lot to be desired, to, to say the least. All right, let's talk about communication. And this is another huge, huge, huge um, aspect of health. Um, and we've alluded, we've said a lot about throughout this, this whole webinar. But uh, in, um, communication plays a huge, huge role in everything your body does. And let's look at it, let's look at it again. You see, uh, the human being, and I like to look at it from outside, look at it from a larger perspective before we go into the cellular level, because you learn a lot by looking at how human function, looking at human function in the environment. Think about this. <coughs> um, many, well, this is business research now. What they're finding out is that employers, employers and business employers, and they've, they've done a lot of research going back to 80, 100 years. Employers, um, well, they interviewed employers and they asked, they gave them about six things, and they said, uh, well, they give them quite a lot, a lot of factors, and they said, well, which of these would you identify would be the six most important things you want in an employee, or the six most important things that are, uh, six most important factors that determine a person's, an employee's rise in the business. And the number one, overwhelmingly, the number one was having a good attitude. And that makes sense. If you have a bad attitude, you really can't work anyway. It doesn't, doesn't really matter how brilliant you are. I mean, you, you, you might work in a really good software company and computers, but if it's dealing with people, um, businesses work through people, and they need people who can who can react, who can interact well. So number one is attitude. Number two was people who could communicate well. And more importantly, people who had a, a vast vocabulary. And speaking about vocabulary, which of course means your words, your repertoire, and the ability to use words well. Back in the 1930s, they did research and they found out that um, they studied the most successful people and they found out that CEOs or company presidents had a uh, larger vocabulary than scientists, than medical doctors, <laughs> than journalists, than authors, and hey, even more than lawyers, our learned professionals. And well, they, they say um, talk is cheap. Well, until you, you wait until you hire a lawyer, <laughs> you know, talk isn't cheap. But anyway, uh, that's what they found out, uh, that, um, and that vocabulary and CEOs are, and presidents are probably the highest paid employee, employees in the world today, and they earn a lot. They found out they have a much higher vocabulary. And what does that mean? What does, where does that take us? Uh, no, which I go on. I'll say that, well, the human being is, rea is interacting with several different kinds of people, whether he, he's with his spouse, his wife, um, the family, at work, at play, um, for success, for help, for to have a good, a full, meaningful life, you have to be able to communicate well. And this also applies even in the army, in the military. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I, I was raised in the army for about 15 years, so I'm very, very, um, I'm a, I study history a lot, military history a lot, but in, in military history, I mean, you see a lot of blunders that happened in some of the major wars in history because um, of a uh, defect in communication. You know, something went wrong in communication, that's what turned the war around. Well, Pearl Harbor is a perfect example. D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, Waterloo with Napoleon and Wellington. Uh, the main thing that turned that around was because the soldiers were not able to get the information. The, the, the Napoleon soldiers, were, were they needed to get reserves, and they could not. The reserves troops were waiting somewhere else. They could not get the information over to them to to bring to bring the reserve troops into the fray, and therefore 
Wellington be Napoleon. But enough of about that. Let's go on to the cell. Again, the immune cell is interacting with several cells in the body, and the way it finds out what is going on is through those sugars and proteins, glycoproteins, and they act as words. It's communication. Uh, we communicate through words, sugars, um, the cell, the immune cell, and every other cell in the body communicates through words. So let's talk about words a little bit. Okay, I had this whole system up there too, but let's talk about words some more. This is a really great quote. <clears throat> for the human body or any organism, for that matter, to survive and indeed thrive in the ho this hostile, toxic world, all its far-flung parts must be in constant communication with one another over long distances as well as locally. This is accomplished by messages sent via nerves, as in the nervous system, in the form of electronic energy we call impulses. They are also sent via the bloodstream in the form of chemicals we call hormones, endocrine system, and to nearby groups of cells via the specialized substances called local signaling mechanisms. So we have three main ways of communication among cells. Now, it doesn't matter which three of them it would be, whether it's through the nervous system, endocrine system, or just locally by locally local signal mechanisms. It doesn't matter what kind it is. Cells receive information through receptors. They receive information through receptors. And what are receptors made up of? Sugars and proteins, all fats. All right. They've been called words of, words of life, and here are some more research articles. Almost without exception, whenever two or more living cells interact in a specific way, cell surface carbohydrates will be involved. Also from a top medical journal, um, Acta Anatomica, again, that's one of the top journals. The last decade has witnessed the rapid em emergence of the concept of the sugar code of biological information. Indeed, monosaccharides represent an alphabet of biological information similar to amino acids and nucleic acids, but with unsurpassed coding capacity. Well, think about that. Throughout these last, we've mentioned a couple of, of journal articles, but in each case, you, talk about, you, you, you hear alphabets, you hear information, you hear code. It's all talking about words, all talking about communication. So back to the cell function. Cell, um, human beings communicate via words. We communicate via words. Cells communicate via sugars. So it stands to reason that the more words you have as a human being, the better you're going to be able to communicate. The same way, the more sugars that are available, sugars and proteins and other signaling molecules that are available to the cells, the better they're going to be able to communicate, the better, the better they'll, they'll be able to get information, the better they'll be able to respond to, to communication, especially where the immune cells are concerned. And the way, the way cells produce these sugars or the way cells make these words, because again, we're talking about words in communication. The way cells make these words is a process called glycosylation. All together now, glycosylation. Are you there, Sherry? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Glycosylation. All right. Is it? And the glycosylation, and I, <clears throat> there has been um, uh, some kind of some uh, debate about what glycosylation really means, but glycosylation is really simple. Glycosylation is the addition of a sugar molecule to a protein or a fat. Simply the addition of a sugar molecule or a sugar a group of sh groups of sugar molecules to a protein or a fat. Here's how it works. <coughs> Sugars are, excuse me, the first step here, number one. The protein is actually made in the nucleus, <coughs> made in the nucleus, and they get into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, the sugars, uh, many times they're converted from other kinds of sugars or 
uh, the, the other stakes are converted from the first two. Well, they form a sugar chain or polysaccharide chain, which is added to the, sh the protein, uh, sometimes fatty acids, and then that eventually gets to the surface of the cell where it forms the receptor or a sense organ or whatever it is that receives the information. This has to happen every single moment, minute, second of the day. It ha your body, your cells are constantly, constantly making these receptors to replace damaged receptors or worn out receptors, in addition to other things on the cell, cell surface. Make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. This has to happen all the time, all the time. If, um, in other words, uh, you think, think about it this way. The more this happens, the healthier you will be because the more your cells will be able to communicate, the more your cells will be able to use drugs better, the more your cells will respond well to hormones, your, the more your cells will respond, will respond better to nerve impulses. If you, the cells don't respond well, the body begins to de deteriorate. If your cells get the wrong signals, your body begins to suffer harm. So um, when I talk in these in, in, in live to live audiences, kind of like after this long process of just sending, giving people all kinds of information, I'm sure people are just brain t brain dead by this time. So we try and round round up the whole meeting by something humorous. And so we, we what I call, I call it this good cell bad cell kind of thing, as opposed to the good cop, bad cop thing. And so basically, I get, I get, I get people all looking at these two cells. On the left, you have the what we call uh, Little Miss Green with Envy. <laughs> and then on the right side, we have Little Miss Sunshine. You can see she's all yellow and got, got lots of those glycoproteins on the surface, a lot of those sugars. Little Miss Envy does not. So. What we tell the audience is, okay, we're going to clap. We're going to look at these two and say, okay, which one would you choose? And I point to Little Miss Envy, and nobody claps for her, of course. And, of course, you can see she's very despondent. And then next, I point to Little Miss Sunshine, and she's shy. She's waving her hand. And then next, and everybody's, like, shouting, and it's like, yay, clapping. And before <laughs> you know it, Miss Sunshine is jumping up and down, and Miss Envy is so, so unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's goofy, I know, but hey, it gets as we can. Huh? It gets the point across. It gets the point across, and that's what we're all about, isn't it? <laughs> okay, and the bottom line is, if you don't have glycosylation, you don't have life. Well, you can also take that to mean also that if you don't have adequate glycosylation, which is the case most of the time, well, you don't have good health. You just don't have good health if you don't have adequate glycosylation. Now, we're not saying you have to take glyconutritional supplements, although that would be the, my first suggestion, but um, you can also get it from, from other kinds of foods and nutritional supplements and all that. But what is better than having a combination of all eight or at least a close company, something that comes close to helping your body produce all eight. I mean, what is better than that? And of course, this came out in the 2003 MIT Technology Review. Review: The medical potential is absolutely enormous. It's also in the physician's desk reference. Uh, doctors all use this book. And back to the quote we had at the beginning, this is going to be the future from Johns Hopkins University. We will not understand immunology, neurology, developmental biology, or disease until we get a handle on glycobiology. And here's from the Royal, Coll Royal College of Medicine, UK probably the most prestigious college of medicine, sugars are going to be the molecules of the next decade. Glycobiology is one of the last frontiers of science to be conquered, and it is going to be at the cutting edge of a large number of discoveries and therapies over the next decade. doesn't get any bigger than that, folks. All right. We've been here a long time. Um, but you guys have stayed with us throughout this whole time. We haven't lost anybody yet, have we, Shay? Not too many. Well, great. Good job, folks. Well, 
here's what it comes down to. The human body heals itself by Dr. Roger Williams. The human body heals itself. Nutrition is what provides the resources to accomplish that task. As we grow older, as we constantly are bombarded by toxins everywhere, it becomes extremely important, extremely important for us not to ignore uh, information that comes our way, our way that can help us make our cells function better. Now, you may say, well, I don't feel any pain, I'm healthy, um, everything is going fine. Well, even if other people think you look good, even if you think you're healthy, if you think, if you don't feel any problems whatsoever, in the final analysis, what health is all about is really not how you feel, but what you do on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis. And what we know is this. If you're not taking all seven food groups, if you're not doing the things that help to maintain and increase the strength of your body cells, you are compromised, and eventually it's going to show. The next question is, if you know of something that can help your body's function better, whether or not you're in a state of ill health, if you know there's something that's going to help your body work better, should you take advantage of it? And I hope that in the last hour and a half or so, we have been able to show you that you absolutely should. All right, well, that comes to the end of this, this webinar. Um, Sherry, you have any questions? Let's see. There are just a couple. Um, what the question about the pH balance, do you know what the pH balance of like a glyconutrient kind of supplement, have they, is there a information on that, what the pH of those things are? Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, somebody is wanting to be careful to maintain their pH balance, uh -huh. so they want to maintain a high pH, and uh -huh. so they're just wondering what the pH level of glyconutrient supplement is. Oh, 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 oh um, um, let me say without, without um, 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 indicating any specific supplement. Hey, sure, um, okay. If you're talking about a fruit juice, if you're talking about a fruit juice, um, they, they may have different pHs. But there really isn't any 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 pH level with glyconutritionals. I mean, these are, these are sugars. Um, they are basically don't have any pH level to them. Um, but some people have glyconutritionals in fruit juices, which are combined with other fruits that have some lower pH or the other. But here's the deal, folks. Here's the deal. We we know that even with fruit juices, uh, when you talk about oranges, for instance, which are a little acidic, they do not make your blood acidic at all. <laughs> There's research that shows they, they, they don't. They, when your body takes them in, your body uses them, um, uses the, the nutrients from the, from the oranges, and, and it, it basically helps to re -reg regulate your pH levels. It's when you talk about certain chemicals or toxins that can um, lower your pH or increase your pH. Um, your body pretty much maintains pH in a very, very narrow range. Uh, let me see if can I remember what it was, 7.46 or so. Um, bottom line, folks, don't worry about the pH thing with 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 uh, with um, glyconutrients. Okay. Uh, let's see. This uh, person says that they are adding more polysaccharide-rich foods to their diet. Uh, they're concerned about soil depletion. Is there mm -hmm. any info about the types of soil nutrients required for optimal production of the polysaccharides? For example, Costa Rica's aloe is grown in volcanic rich soil. Uh huh. Is there any question about the what? I'm sorry, I was asking somebody else's question while you were, while you were talking. Sorry, go ahead. So the question is is there any information about the types of soil nutrients required for the optimal production of polysaccharides? Huh. Um, I am not an agricultural scientist. Um, no, I'm sorry, do not know how to answer that question. What we do know is that uh, over 85% of the soil in the United States is depleted of vital nutrients. Uh, most, most agricultural soils now have ammonia, NH, nitrogen, and a couple of other things that you just put in the soil to replenish it. Um, 
Um, I, I'm sorry, I am not versed mm -hmm. in that. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions on that? That pretty much wraps up our questions. So. Okay. Uh, Glyconutrients can also help in, in regards to stim stimulating, like if there's damage to brain or nervous tissue, for instance. Your body can actually help. And I'm not trying to answer a question. Somebody just typed, Jose typed, or is it Joseph typed in. Um, your, your body can actually um, repair and regenerate. Um, Glyconutrients can help to accelerate that regeneration of nerve cells that your body is already doing and or trying to do, but even also in addition to that, because your brain is so full of connections, um, if there is damage to one aspect of the brain, um, your brain actually also strives, in addition to making new cells, your brain can also strive to make connections to other parts of the brain that will help to compensate, compensate for the damage that's that for the damaged part. So other parts of the brain will take up the slack for the damaged part with good nutrition. That means, um, especially when it comes to brain health, and I would suggest you also get out, get, out, um, get out information on the human brain. With good nutrition, you can actually uh, include fatty acids, sugars, some vital um, minerals and vitamin supplements. They will help your body uh, repair and and pick up, uh, help your brain repair and pick up the slack for the damaged part. Okay, any more questions? Um, let's see. It looks like um, you've answered most of them, David. Did you just call me dude? Yeah, it looks like you've answered most of them. Okay. All right. Well, folks, um, anything else you want to add to Sherry? Nope. Thank you for all this great information. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Thank, thanks for hanging in there. And if you have any more questions or anything else you want to add, please email us, okay? Um, again, take control of your health and have a great weekend. Bye.